Be seated. Welcome to City on a Hill, the best kept secret in Jefferson County. I'm always thankful. Um, I'm always thankful on Father's Day for uh, the resurrection. Uh, my daddy. My daddy is uh, like at the feet of Jesus, who's at the right hand of God the Father this morning, and uh, that makes me thankful. Uh, death is just this little transition. We don't need to fear it, right? So as we get started this morning, I invite you to open a Bible to 2 Corinthians chapter 11 as we're uh, flowing through Church Gone Wild. If you um, heard that we had a full house in here Thursday night, Michael Shattuck slayed this passage, and so if you want to hear a good sermon on it, you can always go back and check it online. It'd be fantastic. He was great. So uh, we're just going to bore straight into this this morning. Second Corinthians chapter 11. starts like this, says, I wish you would bear with me in a little foolishness. Paul's going to be very human this morning. He's going to speak to us as a human daddy and uh, actually step outside his norm with us. He says, do bear with me. Sometimes I have to tell you that we as that shepherd and lead, we just have to say this, listen to me. <laughs> If you shepherd and lead around the church, if you're raising children in the gospel, sometimes you just have to say, listen to me. What is best for your life right now, you don't know, you can't see. Listen to me. I'm praying for you right now that the Spirit give you ears to hear. That's what Paul's saying here. Do bear with me. You need to receive counsel. And the counsel today is going to come from my authority, and not because I'm here speaking on my own. Anytime that you're filled with the Spirit and helping somebody in counsel, you better hope that it's not you. Paul's saying, I'm here to give you the one true gospel and how trusting it will turn out well for you. I can't tell you how many times I've stood in front of what's now been thousands of people in the Conquering Addiction course, and, and ironically, as I'm looking out at people rejecting and rejecting and rejecting the council. It's always fantastic, like the fifth time somebody comes to Conquering Addiction to see the light bulb come on. Being reminded that we don't change anybody, that it's the spirit that changes, and so we just have to be patient in those deals and just keep being faithful with the one true gospel. And I was reminded yesterday that I hadn't seen a whole lot about my life till my fifth time teaching Conquering Addiction. And so we just have to be patient. His authority that Paul is going to speak about today, our authority, you see, we don't even like that word, right? I mean, some are already in the room. Some are bristling, right? Paul's authority carries love, not a, a judgment stick. It may bang into our heart idols and feel like a judgment stick, but it is carried fully and wholly in love. That's discipleship, honestly, is teaching people that you can set yourself under the authority of God. You can set yourself under the authority of other people. You can set yourself under their authority, and it's not demeaning. It's actually loving. But sometimes we need to use creative means to communicate truth. We're going to have some fun this morning. It's going to be a little bizarre. I know you're shocked. Because sometimes, I don't know if you've noticed, I use humor with you maybe even write on occasion in some satire. I hope that it doesn't get over into sarcasm because the root word of sarcasm is to cut flesh. I don't know necessarily that we want to cut flesh. We want to remove flesh. We want to step out of the flesh. But I don't know that I want you walking around bleeding. And so I hope that it's satirical and not sarcastic. But most of my humor has a point. If you'll notice, it often carries some little meaning behind it. And Paul's going to be funny this morning. For kind of a short, ugly dude with kind of a, you know, not a real flamboyant personality, he's going to make his attempt this morning at, at, at humor. But that humor is always designed to communicate a strong point and to do so in a more pleasant manner. Now, some people don't receive that very well. Like, like if you're laughing with me, the point must not be that big a deal. Well, don't be deceived this morning. Paul is going to use some humor, but it's the biggest deal this morning. He's explaining why he wants these false apostles out of the Corinthian church with some satire. And so I encourage you not to ever be confused about if somebody's making a point where they're using humor to make the point that the point is any less poignant. Um, it's, 
I do that. I'm just trying to do some of that on occasion in a more pleasant manner. I might not actually be funny, but it is what it is, right? So um, others do it as well. If you uh, are uh, kind of tech savvy and you spend some time on the internet, you, you may read the Babylon Bee. The Babylon Bee should be in your favorites, and you should uh, just t try to take it on. Because the Babylon Bee is doing exactly what I'm talking about. It's satire. It's, uh, and it takes some practice to understand that behind the humor of the Babylon Bee is always a strong point. But it takes some practice to understand good, good satire. So we're going to practice here this morning. The first one I want to show you from the Babylon Bee is just being funny. That there's a, they put up this deal where a church mistakenly employs a homeless musician for three years thinking he was the new youth pastor. And he, but the point is he comes in smelling of patchouli with a, you know, he hasn't shaved in like forever because his only shower has been patchouli recently. And he has a guitar with him and they've been waiting for their new youth pastor. So they just brought this homeless dude in and started made him the youth pastor for three years because he had all the signs of what a youth pastor would would have. Roll it, scroll that down. We'll just look at a couple of the... An internal investigation revealed that Dickinson had been sitting on the corner of Dakota Street and First Street one summer morning paying acoustic covers of Radiohead songs in hope of scoring some change from passerbys. Wandering into the church to ask if he could use the restroom, he was immediately assumed to be the new youth pastor. Due to the guitar he was carrying, and as well as his unkept looks, Birkenstock sandals, and distinct uh, patchouli smell. <laughs> he ends up being the youth pastor every three. That didn't really happen! <laughs> Can we just get that on the table? Figurative language is, uh, satire is usually made up. You know, if you go back and read Jonathan Swift or some of the great satire writers of our age, there were not really little people. Everybody know, you see, everybody, we've got to catch up some people on the, on the history of literature, apparently. Jonathan Swift, there were not really little people. There were not really giants. It was satire. And so um, we've got to enjoy uh, the humor Another one of the Babylon Bees says that man enjoys, uh, chooses self as accountability partner. I love that. Like, you ever seen that one? Like, like, that is so much our culture, right? I'll have this internal battle, thank you, but stay out of my business, right? So, and there's another one. I, this one I just love. This is an old one that on, the, on the daughter. The, a couple discovered that their daughter was in 12 years of, got that second one? That their daughter was in 12 years of uh, quarterly church attendance, and they're shocked by her laugh, lack of faith. Is that one? Rolling up? Nope. All right. Anyway, that's the whole deal behind uh, the, the second Babylon Bee is that this couple had been, uh, each, the, anybody have this, uh, like their daughter had been attending around their sporting events and attend once a quarter for about 12 years. And when they were just seriously shocked that she wasn't deeply believing in, in Jesus. Later we're going to understand, we're going to experience Paul making a point with satire. But he starts off on a serious note here, and I want you to hear Paul's heart here because I want you to hear my heart here this morning. Paul loves the church. I join him in that love. I'm inviting you this morning to join Paul and me in the love of the church. He died defending the sanctity and holiness of the bride of Christ. Let me say that again. Paul died defending the sanctity and the holiness of the bride of Christ. Nobody came to his side. Nobody died with him. He died alone. I may die do that, doing that someday, and my question to you this morning is, would you, would you come by my side? Are you to that level of love of the church? Not love of me. Are you to that level of love of the church? My biggest disappointment in the early church is that nobody died with Paul. Nobody stepped up and said, I believe what he believes. Take me too. He's done playing games this morning with the opponents of the gospel. They're teaching another gospel. Look at this beautiful piece of literature right here. It says, for I feel a divine jealousy for you. Verse 2. Since I betrothed you to one husband to present you as a pure virgin to Christ, but I'm afraid that as the serpent deceived Eve by his cunning, your thoughts will be led astray from a sincere and pure devotion to Christ. Paul says, that's why I'm protecting the purity of the church, and that's what I'm saying we're going to do here. We're going to protect the purity of the bride. Let me get this uh, word betrothed out before you here. 
Our culture is so messed up about marriage, we can't even fathom where Paul is going here. In the culture that Paul is talking about, when somebody became engaged to be married, it was a done deal. That marriage was going to happen. You had a man who saved up money to come and present this lavish gift to the family of the bride and say, we're sealing the deal with this sacrificial gift. I'm going to have to I mean, we can't even find dudes who can save up for a ring now. And now, and we're wanting to uh, talk about this betrothal level where this man saves up this lavish gift to say, I am so enamored with your daughter. I am so locked in with your daughter. I'm so committed to your daughter that I will sacrificially, can you hear all the gospel in this? Are you catching the gospel in this? Jesus says, I am so committed to you that I will save up this sacrificial. You can have every drop of my blood. And we start singing songs about this glorious death of Jesus, this, this um, bridegroom that, that has this dowry of all of his blood for his bride. That's the gospel, man. That's too good to be true, right? And the couple would come together and they would clink wine glasses together. I love it. Good wine. Clank them. And then drink together, drink deeply to this commitment. Think about this. This is where we are now. The wine glasses have already been clanked. The day you met Jesus, the day you were filled with the Spirit, you clanked wine glasses with Jesus. And you came into this betrothal. See, the wedding hasn't happened yet. We're waiting on that. There were some hints at it in a couple of songs there, and I heard you shouting. This little bitty ragtag bunch here, I heard you, I heard you shouting about this consummations that come in, and you should because this wedding, this feast, this consummation, I mean, let's be honest, sex is given to us as a gift so that we would anticipate this consummation of this wedding. Amen. Amen. <laughs> and we should celebrate often. I told you we we're going to get after it. See, Jesus this morning has declared his intentions for his bride. Are you, are you catching this? He's not going anywhere. We are with a bridegroom that's not still peeking around to see if there's something better. Are we like the culture now that when I hear about engagements, I'm always going, I don't know about that. I think that probably this bride is still kind of just enjoying that this is an engagement because she's still peeking around. She's still going, is there a bridegroom that's got a better dowry? Is there a bridegroom that's got some better stuff? Are we the church, right? This proposed bride... It's still peeking around to see if there's something better, to see if there's a better, better groom. I say we live our lives a lot of time as though there is. The wedding date is set. There's quite a feast planned, and consummation is on its way. The reason it's been so pitiful that the church has made sex something dirty is that Everything about our marriages is supposed to point to this. Everything. Can we be some adults? Can we just grow up and talk about what it's really designed to do? See, death and, Jesus' death and resurrection allows us this beautiful thing that Paul's talking about here. If you hear the language there, he's talking like his Ephesians 5 deal where he says, we are the church that's to be presented pure and holy and blameless to this groom. And even if you sinned 400 times this morning, which some of you did, you will be presented holy and peerless and blank because it's not based on your performance. It's not based on that. It is based on that which has already been done by him. If you'll just simply trust in that, you will be presented to this. I mean, can you see, can you see this day Jesus comes back and we come bursting through? The, we're that bride that comes through the door, right? And we have a hard time seeing that when we come through that door that we are holy and spotless and blameless. We have a hard time believing that because we know how we really are. And yet that's what we are when we come through that door. That's how good Jesus is. That's how good his righteousness is. And can, we get, can you gather here that in the middle of Paul clowning a little bit this morning, there's some serious business here? Because the false apostles who are hanging around the Corinthian church are pointing to other bridegrooms. All over our culture, all around you, you have people in your life who are pointing to false bridegrooms. Voices. 
voices saying, there's much better places to get married than to that dude. Much more fulfilling. Honestly, for 20 years now, I've been trying to describe for couples preparing for marriage why we ask them for purity in their preparations and why God is so serious about this idea of purity. Can you hear it? Can you hear every analogy that as you're raising your 10-year-old daughter and your 10-year-old son that we would prepare them that your life here is going to either reflect what the church is supposed to be or what it's not supposed to be? And yet if you fouled it up, Jesus is so good, he's cleaned you up and presented you pure and spotless and without blame anyway. It's too good to be true, isn't it? That's why you will ask, I hope your teen son and your teen daughter to remain pure. That is why a husband is asked to sway his wife's heart toward Jesus, to present her holy and blameless before the Father. That's the purpose of a man in marriage. You want to know what a definition of headship? It is that I will take the lead in just modeling Jesus for you, showing you Jesus, talking about Jesus, loving Jesus so that you could be presented holy and blameless to the bridegroom because you know him. It's a picture of us, God's holy bride, preparing for a glorious day of consummation to our true bridegroom. As much as I hope you dudes in here who it's Father's Day, I hope as much as your wife adores you being the bridegroom, you ain't the ultimate one. There's one much better. And so your job as the bridegroom is to point her to him. And for a shepherd of a church and a church that's helping me under shepherd, that's why, listen to me, that's why we will ferociously defend the holiness and sanctity of this bride, this thing, not this building. I'm talking about you. We will, we will ferociously, fiercely defend the honor of the doing that. And, and, and there's only one way that we do that. It's a simple package. It's not that we start in basing in legalism and throwing law, rules on you that, you, you know, don't embarrass us out there. That's what the church did, right? Almost destroyed the church. A bunch of you were raised in church like that. The way you defend it is to do what Paul does. You make much of the name of Jesus, period. And then you watch him change people. You watch him make people look and act and feel holy and without spot or wrinkle. If I had a daughter dating her, it would have been a little uncomfortable. Have everybody ever kind of got that idea? Like, and it may, I don't know how many of you have daughters, but, but it, would, it just would have gotten, like, uncomfortable. And I can be uncomfortable company here. I understand that. But just understand what's going on there. Is I'm not ever upset with you. I'm just ferociously defending the honor of a holy and pure bride preparing to meet her bridegroom. The people of God, the church, are being prepared for a wedding, the reception of all receptions, and a consummation. May we present her, if we're going to, let's pray right now. May God, may we present her without spot or wrinkle or blemish. How do we do that? By putting rules? No, God, help us to simply point to the one that makes us spotless and pure and without wrinkle. Amen. So if someone tries to deceive this gospel of holiness, I will become fierce. It's the fastest way to go to head to church discipline here, by far. The presenting of any, I mean, you, you bring a false teacher into our midst, you, you, you present any type of false gospel, it's the fastest way to church discipline here because it, is, because it is the fastest way to send people to hell. It is the fastest way to provide another voice in the midst of them trusting you to a slippery slope downhill. See, folks have surrounded you in your entire life saying they have your best interest at heart. But unless they drew you closer to Christ, they were a false shepherd. Like the one in the garden, the serpent. Understand that's what Paul's saying here? That if you have any voice that leads you anywhere except closer to Christ, it is a false gospel. They are a false shepherd. That includes some of your parents. That includes some of the, your closest friends. And that doesn't mean you hate them. That means you love them by giving them the gospel. Because we were once false shepherds as well. Such were some of 
us. Those people can be your mission, they can be your ob object of love, but listen to me, they cannot be your voice of influence. Paul is being clear today. You Corinthian church, you have some people who are trying to be your voice of influence, and they are a false shepherd. They are presenting a false gospel, and they must go away. That would not necessarily mean physically. That would mean as a voice of influence in your head. That's repentance. They got to go. Remember this. We are always, always, at every moment of every day, either an agent of the kingdom of Christ or an agent of the kingdom of darkness. There's no middle ground. There's no middle ground. Why do we ask you to live a holy life at home? Dads, why do we ask you to clean up your act at what you're looking at, what you're involving yourself with, because your sons are watching? And you are neither an agent of light or you are an agent of darkness. I don't care if you're saved or not. You're either one or the other at any given moment. So whose agent are you listening to? Whose agent are you? Verse 4. For if someone comes and proclaims another Jesus than one, the one we proclaimed, or if you receive a different spirit from the one you received, or if you accept a different gospel from the one you accepted, you put up with it readily enough. This is us. For decades now, we've been putting up with a, with a, with a, with a performance-driven gospel, with a legalism gospel, with a licensed gospel. For decades, we've just said it's fine. Our big idea this morning is it's time for us to be done with false gospels and false gospel teachers. At this church, I'm declaring to you now, we will follow Christ and we will follow Christ alone. We can sing in Christ alone all you want, but unless you're actually teaching in Christ alone, grace alone, faith alone, Christ alone, you're a false teacher. I'm a false teacher. We will not put up with false gospels, ever. And the reason is we don't want to clown with the betrothal. You see how we would clown with the ultimate marriage if we would do that? Verse 5, Paul says, Indeed, I consider that I am not the least inferior to these super apostles. Okay, he's starting into his satire. <laughs> these super apostles. Even if I am unskilled in speaking, I am not so in knowledge. Even if you don't like the way I speak, trust what I say. Indeed, in every way, we have made this plain to you in all things. Never decide a shepherd in your life. Don't be like the, remember them walking up to David and going, well, man, that dude's just a little punk, right? He doesn't look the role. And yet, modern Christians make their decisions all the time on who's the most charismatic, who's got the biggest TV ministry, who's got what, right? Look at the heart. And by the way, nobody would have chosen Paul today. Short, ugly dude, didn't speak well. Would not have played well on TV, would have never been elected president of the United States. And would have, made, would have been the best of any of those things. Not as skilled and humble and full of Jesus, beats charisma and charm and good looks every time. How much Jesus is flowing out. That's how you choose a shepherd. Verse 7. Or did I commit a sin in humbling myself so that you might be exalted because I preach God's gospel to you free of charge? Satire. Why was it free? Because the false apostles are in the game for money, so Paul is showing an alternative. Better that I serve you for free, he says. He says, I robbed other churches. Now here comes satire. Hyperbole. My former basketball players pronounce that hyperboil, just so you know. Right? Exaggeration. He didn't really rob other churches. You know, some people, some, some literalists read that and go, oh my God, Paul was a thief. No, he didn't actually rob other churches. It just felt like, a, like, a, like rob, because those churches were broke. <laughs> Yet people who didn't have anything funding his ministry. He says, I robbed other churches by accepting support from them in order to serve you. That was the best way to do this because you guys are quick to be deceived towards money. For the brothers who came from Macedonia supplied my need. Was, by the way, can we just get it on the table? The Corinthians are probably tired of hearing about the brothers in Macedonia. Right? Like if, I, if, if, if there were some folks that just gave like crazy somewhere around, I just kept pounding you guys. Man. I mean, you, you really need to be like the brothers in Macedonia. You'd get tired of hearing about the brothers from Macedonia. 
So I refrained and will refrain from burdening you in any way as the truth of Christ is in me. This boasting of mine will not be silenced in the regions of Achaia. And why? Because I do not love you. God knows I do. He comes out of the satire. God knows I do. And the simple point is this. You don't want shepherds who are in the game for personal gain. You don't want career shepherds. I know a lot of dudes that are pastors because they need a job. They should quit tomorrow. Any elder who is eldering a church because he needs a job needs to quit tomorrow. Anybody who's in this for financial gain needs to quit tomorrow. Stop it. That's not a qualification. Uh, Babylon B at this one. Uh, not the right one. Is there one about a 98 Corolla? So this pastor, uh, his elder board pulled him in and got after him for purchasing a 98 Corolla for $1,500. Thought it was luxury. Too much. Right? It was in, uh, in violation of the, of the um, too, much, too much luxury tax. You can check it out, Babylon B. Whenever it is a burning calling, here's what we'll do. We'll do whatever it takes. There we go. Congregation questions pastor's lavish lifestyle upon purchase of 98 Corolla. It's satire. Roll it down a little bit. Let's read this one. Quorum of church members at Ridgewood Church voted 56 to 3 in favor of formally reprimanding teacher pastor for reckless and irresponsible spending upon the discovery that he splurged on an as-is 98 Toyota Corolla he spotted on Craigslist. You can read the satire dripping all over it. Whenever it's a burning calling to serve God, we will do whatever it takes. Those of you that know Paul's history know that he works at, worked as a tent maker. He was a bivocational pastor. I um, worked as a bivocational pastor most of my life. And uh, at times, in addition to that, churches stepped up and funded his missionary journeys. But here's what mattered. Paul loves Jesus. He loved the church. He loved the people so that he didn't ever worry about where the resources were coming from so that he could live. I mean, this dude was hard to live with, right? When guys are saying things like to live as Christ, to die as gain, they're hard to deal with. He's not, obviously not worried about resources if he doesn't care if he lives to see tomorrow because he thinks going to be with Jesus would be a superior day. Let's get this consummation thing on. That's basically what he's saying. If anyone shepherds for any reason other than a passion to see Christ glorified in a difficult world, they should not be an elder. These men are struggling. Uh, in Corinth, the whole church is struggling because they have men trying to lead who have a personal agenda. You ever known anybody try to get on an elder board because they had a personal agenda? It might not have even been money. It might have been power. You want to talk about a church that if it allows that to happen is going to go down a hard, slippery slope fast. It's that. Must be out of a love of God and a love for people, not gain. Verse 12. Paul continues that what I'm doing, what I will continue to do in order to undermine the claim of those who would like to claim that in their boasted mission they work on the same terms as we do. For such men are false apostles. Let's just get to it here. Not satire right here. Deceitful workmen disguising themselves as apostles of Christ. And no wonder, for even Satan disguised himself as an angel of light. So it is no surprise if his servants also disguise themselves as servants of righteousness. Their end will correspond to their deeds. And Paul just drops the mic. He says, these folks work for the other side. What I'm looking for in my life are men and women who are willing to say, we are going to desperately see who loves Jesus before we make them leaders because anybody who's doing anything in the church except for their love of Jesus, their desire to glorify Jesus should not lead. And so they got to go. Because even if it's just at that moment those people are serving Satan, Paul says. They are servants of 
Satan. And I got to tell you, sometimes the business of removing false apostles from the church is ugly, but it is a must. It is a must. I've lost 30 year relationships, I've lost 40 year relationships, and I've lost family relationships as I had to remove false shepherds. And my question to you would be this If Satan took physical form and walked in this room, would you not remove him if he tried to teach? That's what it boils down to. Would you not remove Satan? But see, we can't see Satan. We can only see his partners. Nice light day, huh? I tried to soften it with the B, man. (laughs) Paul knew this was hard stuff. And so what he does here, he ramps up the the B section, kind of poking fun at his opponents. He, He starts playfully giving his resume here. Not to build himself up, but to show the folly of the approach of his problem children. Verse 16 says, I repeat, let no one think me foolish. But even if you do, accept me as a fool so that I may boast a little. If you're going to accept me as a Those guys who are trying to beat me up, they're fools. I'm just telling you, they're fools. They boast. So if they're going to boast, let me just fool right with them here for a minute. What I'm saying, with this boastful confidence, I say not as the Lord, not as Jesus right now would, but as a fool, like those clowns. Satire. He's not really like those clowns. He would always represent Jesus. He's stepping outside for a second here just to be satirical. Since many boast according to the flesh, I too will boast. For you gladly bear with fools. You've been listening to these clowns. So let me clown with them to make a point to you. For you bear it if someone makes slaves of you or devours you or takes advantage of you or puts on airs or strikes you in the face. To my shame, I must say, we were too weak for that. And now what Paul's going to do is he's going to do what he also did in Philippians 3 where he had some Jewish false false prophets challenging his qualifications. Oh, you want to compare some resumes, huh? You want to roll out a resume against mine? We're going to be foolish? Let's roll. Let's get it on. But whatever anyone else dares to boast of, remember I'm speaking as a fool, satire. I also dare to boast of that. Are they Hebrews? So am I. Check. Are they Israelites? So am I. Check. Are they offsprings of Abraham? So am I. Check. Are they servants of Christ? I'm a better one. Remember, he's being a fool. He would never do that in his humble state. As satire, he would. He just throws it out there. I'm talking like a madman. With far greater labors, far more imprisonments, with countless beatings and often near death. Oh, you need some details? Five times I received at the hands of the Jews the 40 lashes less one. Anybody see the passion of the Christ? 39 lashes on Jesus' back. It was illegal to give 40. Five times Paul took that beating that you saw in the Passion of the Christ. Thirty-nine lashes with a cat of nine tails. You literally leave there with parts of your body missing besides skin. You want to throw a resume out, Paul says? Let's get it on. Three times I was beaten with rods. Once I was stoned, and not Jefferson County stoned. Three times I was shipwrecked. A day and a night I was adrift at sea on frequent journeys. All right, and then, oh, you haven't had enough yet? And how about in danger from rivers? How about danger from robbers? How about danger from my own people? Little shot there, right? Danger from Gentiles. Danger in the city. Danger in the wilderness. Danger at sea. Danger from false brothers. In toil and hardship. Through many sleepless nights. In hunger and thirst. Often without food. In cold and exposure. And apart from other things, there is the daily pressure on me of my anxiety for all the churches. If all those beatings and all that crazy stuff wasn't enough, just the pressure of messing around with you clowns, picture that. Who is weak? And I am not weak. Who is made to fall? And I am not in 
dignity. Here, let me just wrap that up for you. If I did not love you with Christ's love, would I do all that? If I had any agenda other than the glory of Christ, would I do all that? We, should, we, did, we shouldn't necessarily suffer like Jesus, and we shouldn't necessarily suffer like Paul, but we've got to be ready to. Followers of Jesus are ready to suffer like Jesus. And we're too comfortable. I'm not sure that's ever going to happen in this country. We're just too comfortable. Babylon B hit this one. Got that persecuted church one up. I've got to read this whole thing. This is too good. This uh, persecuted church member is going to try out another church. Stating that he just doesn't feel like he's being fed by the persecuted underground church he's been attending for the past three years. You got to remember, underground church is underground because they're under threat of death, right? Local man Sadab, uh, Salim Haddad reported Wednesday that he's planning on trying out a, com uh, a completing church just 30 miles across a deadly pass of open desert that is covered with live explosives. He says, Pastor Malik's a great guy and everything, but I, just, I don't know. The youth program is just okay. Refreshments are lacking. Pastor's a pretty good teacher, but he just doesn't make the living word of God really come alive, you know? Haddad told reporters through an encoded message for fear of giving away the location of the church, which could result in the further persecution or martyrdom of his brothers and sisters in Christ. I heard about another Christian church about eight hours here by foot on the other side of the passage of certain death. I think the, I and the family are going to go check it out. Haddad described his family wish list for a church, including topical, relevant preaching, contemporary music, and feeling like they can really get connected and a casual laid-back atmosphere that's warm and inviting despite having to sneak into the building at night for fear of capture and slaughter by Muslim authorities. We love Pastor Malik and wish him all the best, but we feel like it's God's will for us to go church shopping. I think there's a little point to the satire. Adad said, and we really hope this new church has the vibe we're looking for. People don't change churches in the persecuted church world. They feel lucky to live to tomorrow. They recognize the sacrifice, the sacrifice to death, and the quality of the speaker or his ability to visit the family in the hospital does not matter. Is he Christ and is he Christ alone? There's a single question. Is he Christ and is he Christ alone? Is he going to shepherd me toward Christ? That's it. Paul's point in his satire. You're bearing with fools, so let me be a little foolish to show you how ridiculous it is when so much is at stake. Are you, are you catching that Paul has a desire for you to understand the seriousness of who you allow to teach you the gospel? If all of you left here tomorrow and said, we just don't think that you direct us toward Jesus, I would respect that as a quality reason for leaving here. You know what I'm saying? You hear me? I would, I would so respect that as a quality reason for leaving. But some of the reasons that people leave churches literally make me sick. Paul said, my weakness puts the power on dis of, dis of Christ on display. So in the economy of the gospel, gospel, godly foolishness trumps world wisdom. And at the heart of Christian folly is the crucified Messiah, Right? It's folly. The simplicity of the death of Jesus, the resurrection of Jesus, empowering every need that we have, that's folly to the world. Roll out gospel fluency out there for somebody who doesn't believe in Jesus. They'll laugh in your face. Paul's catalog of sufferings is the greatest argument for his apostolic authority because it demonstrates his solidarity with God. Here's my question for you today, is when things get tough, whose voice do you listen to? Like, to me, that's what we're trying to do here in discipleship. We're trying to say, when, I understand that when things are good, you, you praise God, well, glory to God. I read, I read Facebook, I see, glory to God. This burrito was fantastic. <laughs> right? But when things are tough, Where do we go? 
Christ suffered. Paul, Christ's apostle, suffered. We suffer also. As we understand our trials and sufferings in this light, we discover far from disqualifying us from experiencing and proclaiming the gospel, they actually qualify us for it. See, what the world wants to say is if you're suffering, you don't qualify. Something must be wrong with you. God's blessing must not be on you. And what God says is if you're suffering for my sake, you are the most qualified. So we hang out here yesterday with all kinds of women who have been put through sexual trauma and, and suffering in their life that I can't even fathom. And I'm all day going, you can tell me about Jesus all day long because you qualify. I don't think you're weak because of what you've gone through. I think you are ultimately stronger than I am because of what you've gone through. You are so qualified. God uses the hardest and most shameful experience of our life to soften us and bring us to fuller understanding of surpassing benefits, but in the flesh it tends to harden us, right? We get mad because our life doesn't look like the folks who have it supposedly easy. And Facebook is such a facade. Social media is such a facade. All these smiling pictures on the beach. Those people just hammered each other in a fight right before that. <laughs> So in other words, let's, let's understand Paul's point. God never wastes a hurt. God never wastes a hurt. What is revealed today? Hey, let's carry this into communion right now, okay? Let's just, let's just roll this into a meal. Paul is showing us that he's worthy of being followed because he gets what I call the Soma centerpiece. You want to know why we're Soma? Here you go. It's that we are loved by the Father. Paul understood how much he was loved by the Father. In the midst of it, can you picture him floating on a board after one of those shipwrecks? What is going through his head? I know right now, I know right now that things don't seem so good. I don't know if I'm going to live through the night, but I'm deeply loved by the Father. The second one is consumed by Jesus. I'm going to assume that all of you that are married in the room at one point in your life were consumed by your spouse. You couldn't think about anything else. You two are ridiculous. You two like really love each other and just like really talk highly of each other. And, and, and so I, I know you guys can relate to this. There's like this, and maybe you're still in this and that's beautiful, but you're like, so, so there's, this, there's this deal where we're like consumed, right? We can't think about anything else. That's how we're supposed to wake up feeling about Jesus. Like, like he's our everything. So as we take this meal today, like, he says, as, as often as you eat this and you drink this, do it in remembrance of me. And so we, like, anytime we, like, pick up bread to eat, these prayers that we say over meals, sometimes I want to puke, man. Like, can we, like, see what the food is designed to take us to? It's not designed to, like, just take us to some mundane place. It's designed for us to remember, be consumed by Christ, what he's done. Would you rather eat a meal? <laughs> And it'd be like the greatest meal you ever ate without Christ? Or like some PB&J and J with it being all about Jesus? It might be tough. And then we must be dependent on the Spirit. Here's why I love teaching Paul. I admire him so much for being so dependent on the Spirit. I want what he had there. Where... As he walks in into an environment, he's not walking in and things happening. Now he's having to reactively figure out what to say or what to do. He's walking into a place consumed by Jesus and filled with his spirit so that the response now is a flow out of that which has already happened. Not in constantly going, well, I didn't respond very well, so now I need to repent and confess sin and recover. But we even get to do that, right? Maybe that's where you are this morning as we take this meal. So what we're doing here is we're taking this bread and touching in the cup and being reminded of the greatness of Jesus, being consumed by Jesus, reminded how much we're loved by the Father and how much we need to be dependent on the Spirit. Because here's the deal. Here's what I want you to think about and maybe talk about in your groups. Um, there's a lot of voices out there, right? 
Paul is dealing with some bum voices inside the church. And so I'm asking you to consider the voices. Whose voices tend to take you away from Jesus? How do you repent of that? How do you, how do you eliminate that as being a voice of influence without maybe necessarily eliminating the person? Some of the people may just need to go too. But let's be consumed by Jesus. Let's be dependent on the Spirit.